Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. For a Texas Chainsaw interview with one of my favorites in the business, it's Elsie Fisher. I'm so happy to see you. Oh man, I mean, so good to be here. Just spanking around my headphones. <laughs> I'm especially excited to talk to you right now because I love horror, but also I know even beyond Texas Chainsaw, you're doing a whole lot of horror lately. So is there anything that jumpstarted the, the interest in or the draw to the genre for you? Yeah, well, I mean, I I don't know if many people agree with me, but I personally think uh, my film Eighth Grade is a horror movie because real life Eighth Grade was, you know, felt like being a horror uh, protagonist. Um, but, you know, I, I pretty much directly after that, I also um, I did Castle Rock, which was a TV show on Hulu. Um, and that was Stephen King. And that was that was really cool. I don't know. Just been riding with it. Good stuff. I'm mighty excited for your Grady Hendrix movie. Yes, uh, that was such a delight to film, and um, I, I'm a big fan of uh, the book My Best Friend's Exorcism, so it should be fun. I'm psyched for that book adaptation, and I need someone to adapt Horror Store. Have you ever read that one? I haven't read it, but I really want to, because I also think Ikea is very scary, so mm -hmm. it's very visceral, you know? Yes, absolutely. I can understand that. So you do a bunch of horror, but what was it about Texas Chainsaw in particular that made you say, like, this feels like the right movie for me to do right now, where like you could learn something new within the horror genre from it? I mean, I I think for me, I hadn't I hadn't done a slasher before. So it was it was definitely different in that regard, which was a lot of fun um, and a lot of blood. Um yeah, but I don't know. I mean, it's also, it's um, it's a very prominent franchise, which was daunting in a lot of ways, but also, um, you know, it was a fun challenge to take hold of. And I'd, I'd seen the original and I'd loved it a lot um, and been super traumatized by it. So it was fun to hop back in. I feel like this is an unfair question to ask, but do you have a favorite <laughs> iconic slasher? I, I mean, I really, I do. I, I love Texas Chainsaw. Um, I do love Scream a lot too. Uh, which is also getting its own little iteration this year, which I think is so much fun. That like I've never heard like, of it. I have no clue what franchise you're talking yeah, about. Right yeah, now. exactly. <laughs> um, it's so fun though. I, I I like the slashers that mix, you know, uh, comedy and horror elements. So both of them. I always play a little fun slasher survival game on one of my other shows. So I'll I'll kind of post a pose a broad question to you. If you were like real you. We're in a horror movie. What what horror movie cliche would you be? How would you best serve the group to give them a fighting chance to survive the slasher? Mm. Oh, that's a great question, honestly. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think my first instinct is probably like, you know, the um, you know, whatever whatever the nerdy character is, is that probably that one. Um, if I was being generous with myself, I'd say maybe like the leader who like makes it a good part of the way and then sacrifices themselves at the end. Um, yeah. Or I'd just be killed first. There's a lot of options <laughs> to play with. I'm a, I'm a multifaceted person. So I, I feel like I believe in your first answer the most because Randy and scream speaks <laughs> to me. Like I, I feel like I would be Randy and Mindy in the new movie. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think they're, they're very um, relatable, iconic characters. So I'm, you know, I'm flattered. <laughs> All right. Let's talk a little bit about Lila now. So she's got an especially powerful backstory that weaves into the plot of the movie mm -hmm. quite a bit. So what kind of extra prep work do you have to do to just, you know, really understand what she's going through and where her head is at as she makes decisions while trying to survive Leatherface? Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, her her whole backstory was really important for me to kind of um, get right and bring as much um, nuance as I could to it. Because, you know, I mean, of course, this is a genre film. So like, that's not necessarily the focus. But I think, um, you know, being the survivor of a school shooting, that's like a very visceral or that, you know, that's um, unfortunately quite common in my age group. So um, I don't know, I, I did a lot of research. Uh, just kind of what people were like and it was just big for me even like it, it was big for me for her to not be defined by her trauma and still be allowed to be a little like asshole teenager especially to her sister um because then you know it just brings it full circle and then you're also still like rooting for her to maybe not die I hope 
I, I was very caught up in the sister element of it all. Like I, I keep thinking about how I was rooting for both of them to not die, but I also kept catching myself <laughs> feeling concerned for like them not dying, not for them individually, but for each other. So I feel like that's a sign that that element of the movie is very strong. Yes, we did it. We so, did it. <laughs> I love the two of you um, together. Oh, I, it was a lot of fun to make. Sarah is really fun. And, um, you know, it's it's a really fun uh, dynamic between the two of them. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Sarah as a scene part. I love talking about scene partners in general because I don't think we do that nearly enough. So what is something about what she did for you on set as a scene partner that you really appreciated and maybe brought something out of your own character that you wouldn't have been able to access without her? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, she was really great. I think she was very, like, present, um, which, you know... Uh, not like every actor even knows how to be. And that's like a, that's, um, I don't know, that's a big thing for me. So she was always present, always open to um, collaboration, which is also very important for a scene partner. But um, yeah, and it's, um, I don't know. I mean, she also, she kept the environment very light, which ended up being very important for shooting something that has uh, su such a dark tone as this one. <laughs> like we had a lot of late nights where it was just the two of us and we do a lot of just, you know, kind of going crazy with each other, um, keeping each other as sane as we could with like humor, so it was um, great. I'm happy to hear you had that outlet. So, so you said humor, but what else was kind of like the go-to in between takes to make sure that like, you're not like fully consumed by the story and the darkness of it? Um, I mean, I think there were, there were a lot of running jokes that we kind of had. I don't remember all of them, but um, especially when we had gone back to do some of the reshoots, because I think we, we reshot the ending. Um, originally, it was a little bit different, and I love what we ended up doing. But anyways, there's like a, a lot more rain in the stuff we did, and we had gone back in the winter to shoot it. And so we were just like sopping wet in the winter, freezing. And after the takes, we just run into the tent and we'd be like, oh, you know what this movie is? This movie is like kind of like Ratatouille mixed with like, you know, um, Manchester by the Sea. And we just do that with the most random movies we could think of. And I think they were all pretty accurate uh, descriptions of Texas Chainsaw, so. I never would have come up with that on my own, but I'm glad you're sharing. You're opening my mind right now. All right, let's talk a little bit about the gore. I love gore. I think it's art from top to bottom. What is a lesson learned about working on a slasher movie with heavy blood, heavy gore, heavy special effects makeup that you are going to put in your back pocket and take with you to a future slasher film? I, I well, <laughs> I might need a break from horror for a bit. This was intense, but... Um, I think have lots of, lots of makeup wipes cause that blood will stain. Um, and it'll like, even, even just on the, the car ride home from after, you know, the 12, 14, 16 hour days, but even in the van ride home, you can just feel it seeping into your skin. So lots of makeup wipes. Um, and, uh, you know. I don't know, but try to have fun with it. I, I felt like a kid with finger paints half the time, so it was, it was a lot of fun. I appreciate that mentality. Uh, I have to ask you about the bus scene. Was that the most challenging? Oh. I mean, you just described a very challenging seeming set to me, <laughs> but was that particular one more challenging than any of the others? The, well, the nice part was, even though it's quite intense, the amount of time that... Um, like me and Sarah were on the bus was was relatively short, um, and I think I think that sequence also, as as prominent as it is, it goes by quite quickly. It, it you know it's probably not much longer than five minutes I think, um, five ten minutes. But like yeah, so we weren't in there uh, very often, but it was very crazy, and there were a lot of people and a lot of um, yeah a lot of very talented extras we had. The hardest part about the bus scene for me though is right in the middle of it. I get pushed down into that pile of blood. Um, and that was kind of cool on the day because like they had the actual pile on the ground and like blah, blah, blah. But then from that point on in the movie, I'm covered in blood of my entire body. So every day um, that took place after then, they would get the, they cut up this trash bag. So it was flat. They had a, like a milk jug full of blood and they like, 
They're like, all right, get on the ground, kid. Lie down. Um, and it, you know, but this is this is the price I pay to have the the nine to five I have. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm obsessed with all that stuff. It sounds kind of fun to me. All right, before I have to let you go, I'm putting up the spoiler warning because I wanted to ask you not just one now, but now I have two questions about the ending. First, do you have any hope for Lila at the end of the movie, or do you think she is she's kind of like doomed at this point to follow Sally's path now? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's I mean the ending is quite abrupt um, in that way. I think it's kind of open where it could really go either way, and it just depends on um, what what kind of tone you're going for. I hope she's fine. I hope she like gets into therapy and like just has like you know really important conversations and talks about this awful thing, not even in any sort of supernatural scope. Um, and then she starts like doing really well in life and then, um, Leatherface like goes to the city and kills her. <laughs> oh God, that got really dark. Okay. I mean, no, we I think it's, a... it's, it's the karmic destiny of final girls, you know? I guess so. I mean, Leatherface in the city sounds kind of interesting. I'm a big fan of Jason Takes Manhattan, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. So now I have to follow up about the alternate ending you filmed. Can you tell us what that was? And I'm just, I'm, I'm curious, did Melody survive in the other version? The, um, no, it was, it was more, it was more my final encounter with Leatherface. Um, I think it was a lot just shorter. And we ended up adding um, the very cool uh, um, pool sequence and all of that. Um, which, by the way, that that shot of me going through the theater with the gun is like, I think I think that turned out so well, and that was crazy intense to shoot because um, I was holding like an actual, not loaded, but an actual shotgun, um, and that thing is like thirty five pounds. It was heavy, so, so got pretty badass out. sequence right there. Yeah. All right. I mean, yeah. I gotta let you go. You got more Texas Chainsaw celebrating to do. Take, oh. take care of yourself, have a rest, but then hurry up and make more horror movies. This is fun. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. This has been lovely.